Hello, good evening everybody. Welcome to this uh, our hangout with Gregory Doran who is directing this uh, performance of Midsummer Night's Dream which will happen over the weekend and kick off a load of online activity alongside it. Um, Greg, could you talk a little bit about um, why Midsummer Night's Dream as a play seemed to be the right play to jump off from in terms of one, a live performance, but two, other things that are happening around it this weekend? I guess what first, first got, inspired me in a way was reading um, an old almanac it was published, or it was produced in 1608, so during Shakespeare's lifetime. And the manuscript is in the uh, Folger Library in Washington. And it, it being a, a, an almanac, it tells you uh, about saints' days and each of the days of the calendar and when to start your sheep shearing and when right. to do your sowing and plowing and all that. Um, but it also tells you, so, I mean, lots and lots of details like the distance between towns and when the various annual fairs are and things like that. And then it says, on each day, what time the sun sets and sun rises, but more precisely it tells you what time twilight ends and what time day breaks. And that's you know, twilight's some time after the sunset, and daybreak is some time before sun rises. So I looked at um, Midsummer Day, Midsummer Night, in fact, mm -hmm. the, the night of um, the 23rd going into the 24th of June, which Shakespeare would have recognized as Midsummer because it's the eve of St. John's Day. And I looked what, how many hours of darkness there were on that particular night. And it gives you very precise details about when twilight ends and way, when day breaks. And the hours of darkness are exactly three hours and 12 minutes. And when I read that and thought and calculated that, I thought, crikey, that's just about the running time of the Midsummer Night's Dream. Right. So I, it made me think, well, I wonder if there's a way of us performing Midsummer Night's Dream over Midsummer Night mm -hmm. here in Stratford. Because Midsummer is such a, a potent time. And it would have been a great, really potent time for Shakespeare. Because I think what we think of as Midsummer this time of year is when you know the the, the days are lengthening. Ah, you know we're, th we're thinking about strawberries and pims yes. and Wimbledon. Yeah, lovely um, things. Lovely, lovely yeah, things. Yeah. Um, the Elizabethans weren't. You know, I go for a walk um, behind Holy Trinity Church along what's called the the Seven uh, Meadows stretches of the River Avon, and as you walk al along there, uh, you become very mm. aware of the seasons and, and how the seasons are, are, are changing. Um, and one of those, several of those fil uh, fields are full of corn mm -hmm. and, and it's green at the moment and it hasn't, as Titania says, mm -hmm. the corn hasn't grown a beard, it hasn't, mm -hmm. you know, it isn't growing, the, 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 the actual corn isn't ripening yeah. yet. So from Elizabethan mm -hmm. point of view, midsummer was a point when it was a really dangerous time for it to rain. Because if it continually rained and that green corn didn't ripen and the harvest was spoiled, then that led to rural discontent, it led to maybe corn riots. And in the years before Shakespeare wrote this play, there were two or three summers which were really bad in which this had happened. In which, you know, when Titania says the seasons alter, mm -hmm. it really seemed yeah. to be happening. It was climate change happening on a big scale. So for Shakespeare, midsummer is this dangerous time. And in rural superstition at that time, on St. John's, the eve of St. John's Day, a portal was thought to open up between this world and the next. And through this portal, the fairies would pour. It would be like this one time when, the, when there was a transition the between worlds. the two worlds. Yeah. Um, so you had to be very careful because these weren't, you know, these weren't necessarily benign spirits. These were, you know, dangerous creatures. Um, and so what you did at Midsummer was you, you hung uh, garlands of Midsummer flowers like vervain and 
um, St. John's wort mm -hmm. and, and, and yellow bright flowers, and you hung them on the, on the, on the, on the cradle of your child so that the fairies didn't come and steal that child and replace it with a changeling child. Uh, and you put it you know, around the, the buyers of your cattle so the cattle w weren't affected by, by these spirits um, that, that, that were around for about, well, between St. John's Day and St. Peter's Day. But, you know, that was a particularly dangerous right. time. So I guess it made me think that midsummer, for us, is one thing, but for Elizabethans, it's a it's a very very different experience. And I, I guess what's interesting about what you just said about it being a, a portal between two worlds, it being a disruptive time, yeah. it kind of fits with this experiment that we're doing yeah. with Google. That it's a, it's it's live performance as we're used to doing, and we're seeing how that matches in with a, a world that we don't we That's, use in a very um, I guess uh, we report to that world as a theatre company rather than yeah, and we're quite wary of that world. <laughs> you know, we're not sh we're not sure we understand who Titania and Puck and Oberon and 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 all these you know, these peoples are and what these new ways of of thinking are. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was when I was born, I was born in 1958, and the year before I was born, um, Sputnik was sent up into space mm -hmm. for the first time by the Russians. Um, and famously, it went around the globe. It satellited the globe um, in an hour and a half. And I remember very, very early in my life hearing Midsummer Night's Dream on a record for the first mm -hmm. time. And when Puck says he'll put a girdle around about the earth in 40 minutes, my ears shot up, you know, because you Puck was, to to. was twice as fast as yeah. a Sputnik. <laughs> so, my God, he was quick. Um, and so. In the way that Shakespeare is engaging, you know, with as it were modern technology, mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I guess that's what we're doing too. Um, and I think it's it's just a really fascinating experiment, and we have no idea um, how successful it be, w what the criteria are for judging its success. That's true. Um, and in terms of the, your original thought was, well, we'll it's three hours twelve minutes, but now you've decided to place it over the three days that the play. Yeah. Three or four days that the play is said to take. Place. It was, I was persuaded, and I think it was a good decision to to let's try doing the play in real time. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning of the play, I mean Shakespeare has a bit of a double time scheme going, or he simply forgets yeah. what he said at the beginning of the by the end. But he's in the first, you know, uh, Hippolytus says um, four days will quickly steep themselves in night, and then we can get married, and then seems to forget that time scheme mm -hmm. because. The first night, if you like, takes place um, as Hermia is brought before the Duke and uh, condemned to either marry Demetrius and obey her father's will or um, become a nun or be executed. And uh, that's the day she decides that she and Demetrius will elope. And it's the same day where the rude mechanicals decide that the following night they will rehearse Pyramus and Thisbe at the Duke's Oak. So that's sort of night one, if you like. So we're going to do that on the Friday evening. And then the second the, the second night is when the, the rude mechanicals arrive in the forest to rehearse the play. And it coincides with the arrival of Titania mm -hmm. and Oberon into the same bit of forest. Um, and, and then the lovers eloping in the forest. And that mad night, which takes you from Act 2 right through to the end of Act 4, um, we had decided to do that on on the Saturday night, but at the end, when um, Puck says, "You know, my fairy lord, this must be done with haste because day's breaking," we decided we better find out when day was breaking, so that at that point, the day would be breaking as Puck says those lines. And Got the almanac again. <laughs> there we go. Very, very goodbye. Um, and um, what was fascinating was when Geraldine came back to me and said, you do realize that means we're going to be starting the performance at 2.30 on Sunday morning in order for day to be breaking as we finish the play. So, hey, that's what we're going to do. And then the, the, the third day, the day when they, are, they all get back from the forest, uh, the day when uh, Theseus and Hippolyta get married and the two sets of couples marry too, and before, uh, uh, you know, they have to fill in this difficult gap between um, dinner and going to bed, yeah. and it's their wedding nights three, three times over, um, so they decide they'll have a play in that particular time. So we're doing that part 
uh, on Sunday. First, we will rehearse it on Sunday afternoon, but then we are actually going to perform it on Sunday night. And at the point <laughs> when um, uh, Theseus says, "The iron tongue of midnight hath told twelve, it is almost fairy time," Holy Trinity Church, Shakespeare's church, Shakespeare, where Shakespeare's boar was buried and and where he was baptized. Holy Trinity are going to ring 12 o'clock. So the Iron Tongue of Midnight will be told for, I guess, the first time by Shakespeare's own church. Do you, and that, that notion of it being live in time, and you, you're at the end of a day three of rehearsals with a group of, of actors that you've worked with before, yeah. um, and some of them, the majority of them have done either your production in 2005 or 2008. Yeah. Um, how do you think that? The real time, the two, half past two in the morning, especially, I guess, and the second night, how do you think that will affect the playing of those scenes? And is that something that you can think about when you're directing? Or? I guess it's something very difficult to predict. I mean, it's, it's a very interesting way of, of, of breaking down our traditional sort of, and our traditional theatre conventions, if you like. And, and really, the history of the theatre is a history of breaking down those conventions, if you think about it. Um, you know, there was, it, it used to be just open air and um, you know, the, the rough magic, if you like, of the open air performance. Uh, then it went indoors, and the Jacobean masks, which are obviously contemporaneous with Shakespeare, had lighting, we have to remember this. Yeah. And, you know, they, they performed in darkened rooms with extraordinarily elaborate uh, scenic devices. Um, and then, you know, when the, after the restoration, when the theatres, uh, opened. I think it was David Garrick that basically turned out the lights in the auditorium part and kept the light on the stage. Right. So all these conventions have always shifted. Um, I think, you know, over the last decade, over the last 20 years, um, there have been many ways in which theatre has decided to inhabit different spaces, to be site-specific maybe. Um, I saw a most amazing production of Coriolanus last summer by the National Theatre of Wales, which was in an aircraft hangar. We all wore headsets. We followed the action around. We heard the dialogue through our headsets. Mm -hmm. We could go up to the war at, you know, in, in Coriolis, or, or we could be there when Valamia persuaded her, her son to, um, to relent. Um, we could watch it on film, or we could sit down and, and engage with being part of the mob. So theatre practice has changed a, a great deal. Um, I, I've been quite involved in in trying to what, trying to engage how we capture productions that we do, not just from a sort of single camera archive point of view, just to archive it, but mm -hmm. whether there's a way of reconceiving it for the small screen. And we've done this now with the production of Macbeth in 1999, with Harriet Walter and Anthony Scher, with uh, Hamlet um, in, in, in 2009 with David Tennant, Patrick Stewart. Um, and then in the Julius Caesar we did last summer, the African Julius Caesar, some of it we filmed on location, some of it we filmed in the theatre. And so it's, it's been a process of, of seeing how you can reconceive it for a different audience. And now we're about to do live to screen, so we will take um, uh, the, the production of Richard II this autumn, and that will be communicated, you know, broadcast live around the world, um, and be streamed into schools. So I'm, I'm very interested in the process of this. Uh, I think we're probably at the beginning of, of a, a completely different way of, of looking at theatre, though what I'm sure of is that it will never replace the single act of a, of a live human being standing up in front of another live human being and delivering those words so that it's 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 live in one space. I, we'll never replace that. That brings us on because we have. If you've got questions for Greg while we're live on there, and we're going to be here for about another twenty minutes or so, so do push your questions through and we'll pick them up. Um, Laura Rose has uh, said, um, which kind of picks up from this. What do you envision might be the future definition of theatre performance? You've touched on it that it has it's that person to person thing. She says this project really seems to mess with all the rules. In a positive, experimental way, I mean, she says, um, even testing the boundaries of the playing space, actor-audience relationship. Um, what are you particularly excited about in this project, or what does it might it make you want to try in the future? Good question. Yeah, good, good question, Laura. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I really don't know is the answer. Um, I know it's an exciting experiment. I know that the sort of roughness of what we're doing. I mean. 
that in itself is interesting because it's actually, it's a kind of, in a way, it's purer. And by that I mean, we, were, we ran some scenes the other day, and what we've tried to do is engage with the text uh, and have the actors um, just interact with each other without, as it were, too much directorial interpretation. Um, and so the words are doing it in a very surprising way. Um, so that you're getting a, um, it is complicit in that you don't see the fairies dressed as fairies, but then sometimes when you go to production of Midsummer Night's Dream, you might go, oh, they aren't my fairies. But this allows you to have a live experience without, you know, and allows you to superimpose your own imagination on that experience. But I think in terms of reaching a, a wider audience, having some kind of element of interactivity with that audience, I think that's all very, very interesting and, and very exciting. But I really no idea. I think we're at the beginning of something, but I have almost no idea what that is. It's, it's, I think it's a very um, clever experiment in terms of bringing that, the world of um, people who, online who create in their own little world yeah. and trying to, uh, and it, I think it's very clear that we're not messing with the words of Shakespeare, but we're, we're saying what, what else can Shakespeare inspire, what, mm. what other characters might exist. Well, and, and Shakespeare, you know, has always inspired other forms of his own work. Um, and if you think about, sometimes they are they're great interpretations, you know, Verdi's Othello or, or Falstaff, for instance. Um, but Mozart was going to do um, a, 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 a Tempest, we hear. Right. I mean, that, wouldn't that have been extraordinary? Um, you know, you could also say West Side Story is mm -hmm. an extraordinary version of... of um, of, of Romeo and Juliet. Um, so there have always been jump offs. You know, I, I loved the Simpsons episode when they do Hamlet. I, I showed that to my Hamlet company, I seem to remember. Brilliant. So, uh, you know, I think there are lots of different ways. And you, I, I remember Peter Brooks saying this that whatever you do with Shakespeare, Shakespeare will still be Shakespeare. There will still be Shakespeare, mm -hmm. whatever you do to, with, or um, without him. Um, Grant Turner has asked something quite specific about the play. Um, he says the challenge he feels in the play is succeeding with all three storylines, uh, the lovers, the mechanicals, and the fairies. Um, he's got sort of two questions. What world do you find the easiest to realize? And uh, which is the hardest out of those three? Very, very astute, uh, Grant. They're a very good question. I would say there are four worlds, actually, because I think the court, Theseus and Hippolyta, and their world is actually almost the most difficult. But the three worlds that he keeps constantly juggling, and those extraordinarily brilliant craftsmanship of the way that he keeps those balls, those plates, plates splitting, if you like, in the in the air. Um, I I I guess that's the really major challenge of any production of Midsummer Night's Dream is you know how often have you been to see the play and the lovers have been great, but you know the really mechanicals or or the fairies, whatever. Um, and I guess the interesting thing is with the lovers, I have four different actors who have done the play, but in four different productions, and we put them together for the first time. And therefore, there was no blocking, which by which we mean the, the moves that the actors have that are preset. We didn't preset anything. And yet the play, that scene, the big quartet scene, um, was extraordinary. It, 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 it had such... Um, the, the text directs the, the scene. Uh, you know when Hermia won't let go and has to be shaken off, or, or, or when her, Helen is trying to run away, or when um, the real turning point is when finally Helena calls Hermia a puppet, um, and she calls her a maypole, that, and, the, and the, the parameters for fight are set. Um, that is always a joy if you really cast those lovers well. Um, I think the the rude mechanic. Well, I, I don't know. Sometimes I think the rude mechanicals are completely direct to proof. Uh, they, <laughs> they, you know, they, they. A pyramus and Thisbe. All I've never seen a pyramus and Thisbe that doesn't work. I've seen funnier ones than others. Um, I think the fairies are difficult because they have to create. They have to weave a spell. They have to 
create a kind of enchantment. And, and Shakespeare is very clever in the way that he creates the three worlds in that you hear the, the absolutely iambic rhythms of the first scene. It's all in verse, the Hippolyta Theseus scene, the scene with Hermia and her father. Um, then you go to the rude mechanicals, and it's all in prose. And the audience shouldn't go, oh, they're now speaking prose. All you hear is the qualitative difference between the two. And then you go to fairyland, and the first fairy suddenly speaks in a rhythm that's inverted the iambic pentameter. It's over hill, over dale, over brush, over briar, over park, over hill, over flood, over fire. And you hear a different tempo to that world. Um, and I was talking to, to Chris, who uh, Chris Newcomb Hoy, who is uh, our first fairy, as a, and our flute in this production, and he was he was trying to work out who the first fairy was, and then realised he didn't have to be; he just had to introduce the world. If you like, um, I think the fairies are the world in which you have to create a real. I mean, the the character of Oberon is one of the great portraits of jealousy in Shakespeare, along I would say with Iago and Othello and Ford in in Merry Wives. Um, he is a deeply jealous man, and that jealousy and that relationship between Titania and Oberon is, is very real. I think, in a way, the most difficult is the bit that we find hardest, certainly to try and find a design concept that works for, or, I mean, why is Theseus Theseus? Why isn't he just Duke Fred? Or, and why is Hippolyta the Queen of the Amazons? And when they come back in the early morning and they're out hunting and they keep talking about... The be, you know they they seem to compete for who has the best Spartan hounds and and uh, she she's talking about you know she was once with Hercules and Cadmus that mythological world is quite hard to find a kind of rooted reality for it just seems feels as though Shakespeare was there was somebody in the audience that he was who had a very good pack of hounds that he's tipping the nod to or something so in a way the court I guess the court is is some of the hardest to do. And maybe that is why it's now commonplace to double Oberon with Theseus, Titania, and Hippolyta, and Philostrate and Park. Um, I don't think it was done much before Peter Brook did it in 1970. I, I may be wrong with that, somebody can tell me. But um, I, I think that was to heighten the sense of the tensions in the relationship, um, of, of both relationships. You've, you've talked about you know, doing a run through and, and the words really coming out in the text bit, telling the actors what to do. In terms of when you know you've only got a week to, to rehearse, what's in your head as a director in terms of things you have to achieve on each day? Or, or are you very much seeing what wh where it sits and then planning for the next day? You no, know, it's, it's really, I mean, it was a gamble as to whether the actors themselves would either be able to summon back up the parts, the roles, uh, without the business, as it were, that happened, um, you know, any of the, the gags that might have worked in a particular production, um, but that re they remembered, as it were, the, the visible soul of the character. Um, and I think the really interesting thing has been how really stripped away, with nothing, with act, you know, with just rehearsal clothes, no props, playing it in the round, applying no blocking, no production idea to it, how it springs into, into life. Um, you know, there's, a, there's always a moment at the end of a rehearsal period when you run a play in the rehearsal room, and it has a, a kind of potency. Um, and a final run through in a rehearsal can be some, one of the best times right. the play has ever performed. And I always have to say to actors, at that point I have to say, you know, we now go into tech, we get costume, we get lighting, we get sound, we get a big auditorium to play in, and all those things are going to distract us from what we've had this afternoon. Um, and I often feel if you, could, if you could allow people to witness that, the purity of that rehearsal moment, when it hasn't got its costumes, it hasn't got any lighting, it has only rough props, that would be great. And, and in fact, I think Richard Burton, played Hamlet on Broadway, directed by John Gielgud in the early 60s, and they tried to capture precisely that moment. They did a sort of bare boards rehearsal. So everybody had rehearsal props. You know, um, the Queen Gertrude was wearing just a, a rehearsal skirt. And, and I guess the idea was to, to bring as much 
as you needed as an audience to fill in the rest yourself. Um, and that has been an astonishing part of the experience, just to see with just the words, A, how fast it is, mm -hmm. and how, um, how, it's, how it scintillates, how it's just it's like you holding it up to the glass, and and it's sparkling. And the, you know, holding a sort of crystal up to the up to the light, and it just the words somehow just sparkle just by themselves. Does it take you back to that moment when you first heard it on the record? Do you? It does. It it. We were saying at the end of rehearsal today, what was Shakespeare on the day when, when suddenly he said, "I know, we'll do this play," and. Um, It'll be about these amateur actors, and one of them will be turned into a donkey, and we'll have Duke Theseus's wedding, but the Queen and King of the Fairies will turn up, and they'll be having a row. And then we'll have four lovers who are immature when they go into the forest one night and come out the other end completely um, matured, having grown up, having become, having learned something both about themselves and about love and about relationships. And how he does that with such joy, I, I don't know. It's, it's, to me, it's the most perfect of all the plays. Right. It, to me, it's the, it, it is the play that I, I'm endlessly happy to be in its company. Um, it's, it, it has to be the most beautiful play in the English language, mm -hmm. I, without doubt, I would say. And, and what I personally love it is you keep thinking that it's finished and then something else is wrapped up in a beautiful way. And then you get, I mean, I've been sat up here with just above the rehearsal room. You might hear people roaring as lions in the background. Um, that you have, you're using Paul English for his music yeah. in 2000. And the cast have learned, some of them is in their souls somewhere, but the rest of them are learning it. And there is a beautiful, um, the beautiful blessing at the end it of the is. day. It's, you know, when, when we closed the, the RST in 2007 for um, the, 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 the refit, the refurbishment in there, we decided we would have to have some performance, some event that could just close that space um, to lock the ghosts in the walls, if you like. And what we did was we had a, um, we decided that we would leave it entirely up to Shakespeare and we'd have a line or a speech from every single play. Um, and many, many great actors came back. Some, some of us no, no longer with us. Elizabeth Spriggs doing uh, uh, Paulina from Winter's Tale, Tony Church doing um, John of Gordon from Richard II. Um, so we had a, 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 a great lineup to do these tiny little bits of Shakespeare. But at the end, we chose to have the benediction from the end of, of Midsummer Night's Dream. And in fact, it was the Tim Supple's Indian Company were doing Midsummer Night's Dream in the Swan at the time. So we had Patrick Stewart as Oberon, Judy Dench as Titania, Simon Russell Beale as Puck. They delivered the, those final words of the play. And then the curtain rose, and out from behind the, the back of the set, the entire Indian Company with candles came to, to bless the house. It was a, a great sort of benediction for the closing of the theater. It has. It has magic. It has magic. And you're going to be doing that down in the dell, yes. just after the Holy Trinity church bells yes. have run. Yes. I don't think it's going to be a dry house. <laughs> dry in the house. In the house. <laughs> well, we'll see, won't we? But of course, being the seasons altering as they do, mm -hmm. um, midsummer may well be pouring with rain on Sunday. That's true. Um, we have a question from Haley O'Malley, who um, picks up on the fact that you're presenting the wedding live in Stratford and it's part of a, a larger day where people can come down and have hear wedding music, learn a first dance for a wedding. So we're kind of creating an event around a wedding. Um, has this has that affected how you're approaching the play? Are you thinking about anything else? And she said, are you going for a more love and marriage, happily ever after feel rather than a darker and perhaps more overtly sexual approach? With that in mind, probably won't be much sex in the afternoon, Haley. Um, <laughs> but I think, in a way, it's been really interesting to to see how these two parts of this project interact with each other. To some extent, of course, with only a week, I've got very little time to do anything other than 
rehearse the play so that doing it in front of even a, even a smaller audience in the rehearsal room or an audience out out there live in, in the Dell in Stratford can can engage and and you know can can uh, have a, a a real vital experience of the of the play, um, but I think what's been interesting to me is that. Is, is trying to have both the kind of fun side of things, the, the wedding events, are fun, great fun, silly thing. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's lovely when Hippolyta says at the end of Pyramus and Thisbe, or during Pyramus and Thisbe, she says, this is the silliest stuff that ever yet I heard. Um, and there is a lot of silly stuff about. Um, but also being able to engage, hopefully, on a, on a deeper level as questions come up. And as questions come up here in Stratford, you know, we were asking the question, somebody asked a question the other day, what is Eglantine? Mm. Um, and I think we had it as a sort of trivia yeah. question on our, on our blog. Well, Eglantine, which is one of the flowers in Titania's Bower, it's interesting, it's, it is a briar rose, it's a sweet briar rose, um, but it had rather furry leaves, has rather furry leaves, which, um, when you crush them, smell like apples. But the Elizabethans used these leaves as breath fresheners. So it's almost as if Titania has a bit of gold spot or Listerine in her bower. You know? And if she's entertaining donkeys in her bower, then she probably needs that. Um, and the flowers in the bower became really specific and interesting. Um, they don't grow at the same time. Oxlips and violets um, are way out of season by the time you get to midsummer. Eglantine and musk roses are in season, are, are in flower. Um, wild thyme has a deep resinous sense. It's not something that's going to lull you to sleep. It might kind of turn you up rather than the other way around. And, and so we were just in, here in Stratford, where you can walk along the river and, and, and find these flowers, and um, find these plants, um, it, it's really interesting how it can deepen your understanding of of what Shakespeare is taking for granted in the audience's imagination. Um, you know, even to this extent of the fiery welkin, you know, the sky fretted with stars, as, as Hamlet describes it. What was the star light like in Shakespeare's day? When the moon wasn't shining, what was the starlight light? And we discovered that he must have seen a staggering number of stars, which we no longer see because of the light pollution from our cities and streetlights and etc. Um, there are light parks now, there are light reservations, aren't there, in places like Snowdonia. But th th I, I had a conversation with a, uh, the astronomical, the, um, the um, Greenwich Observatory, and they were pointing out that if for one night everybody would turn off their lights, every building would turn off just for one night, the display that we would see, the Milky Way that most British school children have never seen, that display would be so beautiful we would never turn them on the lights at night again. Mm -hmm. and, and yet for Shakespeare that was part of the, the nightscape, if you like, um, and why it was so extraordinary and so magical. So partly, what in terms of the online community, what you hope for is that there's a deeper understanding of, I of hope, Shakespeare. Yes. I mean, and, and you know, just by asking, you know, questions that, you know, we, we were doing the song today where Bottom um, is whistling a happy tune, trying to keep himself from being terrified mm -hmm. when everybody suddenly run away from him, uh, when he's been transformed to the ass's head. And he sings a song about the oozle cock, so black of you with orange tawny bill. Well, the oozle cock, um, which is sort of obvious to anybody, you know, who's seen a blackbird on an English lawn, yeah. is a blackbird. Um, the throstle is the thrush, and the wren is the tiny wee little bird, and we have one just outside our window uh, in, in, in Stratford, the tiny wee bird. Um, and those birds were very absolutely every day to Shakespeare's audience and perhaps to an English audience, but perhaps no longer. But anybody online or anybody around the world who's understanding the play, and Shakespeare, you know, is now is owned globally, you know. He's not the preserve of a, a, a small section of the, uh, you know, the, the, the white middle class, as it were. He's, he's, he is Indian, he's Japanese. When I was doing Titus Andronicus in South Africa, one of the actors said to me, you said in, uh, Shakespeare was, was, was English, and I said, well, I think so. And he said, no, Shakespeare's Zulu. 
and, and Shakespeare has been appropriated, but some of the, the detail of what he's writing about, like, like simple things of glowworms and ooselcocks and eglantine, um, those are not necessarily readily understood globally. And, and a project like this, we can, we can illuminate some of those things. You've also, in term, especially in terms of hangouts, you've had actors popping up from the rehearsal room. But part of this idea of using what's available online is, is you're interested in opening up the rehearsal process a little bit more than it has been. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I mean, I think it is, <clears throat> it's something that we would not normally do because we have a clock ticking, we've got six weeks to rehearse play, we've got, you know, the pressure of time, the pressure of, of also how sacrosanct the rehearsal space is. It's a place where you can fall flat on your face, mm -hmm. where you don't necessarily want everybody to know what's going on because they'll find out when we, when the curtain goes up, metaphorically, on the first night. Mm -hmm. But there are times when engaging in the rehearsal process, um, seeing how it is that decisions are made, how it is we come to, to make the choices we make, I think that, that, that is a very interesting process. And, and a project like this allows people in on that rehearsal. You know, we've filmed quite a lot of the rehearsal. Some of that will go online. Some of that, um, you know, we, you'll see basically a rehearsal in the bits that are filmed on, on, on Friday and Saturday night. Um, and in a way, that to me is, is it's, I know there's a lot of people who would be very interested in that. And normally, we're too nervous to do it because, mm -hmm. because we've got other priorities. But like you say, you've got to be very aware of the actors that you yeah. have in there. That's, that's got to be the priority. Yes, yeah. that room. Yes, yeah. they do, and, and they have to have a sense of security there, mm. there too. But these actors are, you know, comfortable in that they have they played the plays before. Yes, they'll fluff lines or or they'll, you know, um, forget where they are or, or whatever. But the process, I think, is is really yeah, an important one of being of allowing people into it a bit. Okay, and we have one last question because we're coming up to 40 minutes of, of you talking and you need to get back into that yes. rehearsal. You've only got two days left. Um, what is your favourite aspect of Dream? I, I, I guess it has to be partially the, the language. There's, um, there's, there's just something... It is, it's, a bit, it's a bit like how poetry will always stay with you. You know, Frank McCourt in, in that lovely book, Angela's Ashes, describes his childhood when he was sick, as he was quite a lot as a child, in bed, in hospital, and was given Shakespeare to read. And he said it was like having jewels in his mouth. Mm -hmm. And there are times when I can, it, where you can call on poetry to, to articulate beautiful thoughts, if you like. Um, and I guess that that... that being in the presence of that language is is always in itself magical. Um, I think that's that might be my 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 because in a way that's what is so glorious about the the privilege of being able to do it in the, the in the language in which it is written uh, because you you have that as it were that direct access yeah. um, and that's very very special. But it is, you know. It's it's a midsummer's nightmare in in many ways. Dream, you know, dreams are scary. Dreams stay with you and and lurk about in the back of your head. And I think there's a darkness in the play. Um, when I first did it, I'll just tell you this one story. I first did it in upstate New York, in in a community college in in Jamestown, um, and had a wonderful time. I was I was just finishing being a student, and I was somehow invited to direct this, but how they, or why on earth they trusted me, I don't know. Um, and it had, it was, a, it was magical doing it with the students then, and we had one of the staff uh, uh, in the, in, in one of the faculties, uh, we had a sort of uh, Q&A, a question and answer, and one of, the act, one of these staff said, do you think it's appropriate to do this play with, with students? And I thought, gosh, what? Uh, why? And he said, well, you know, here you have a play in which a jealous husband subjects his wife, drugged, to sex with a donkey. So it's got, you know, it's about bestiality and drugs. Is this appropriate for our kids? And I thought, well, gosh, I suppose it is. 
it, you know, it has a very daring, dark, dangerous edge to the play. But somehow, and maybe it's just familiarity mm. that, that softens those edges, but it is undeniably there. There is a dark side. The play, the play is about sex, but ultimately it's about love. And I think that's the that's the, that's the joy, and it's about Lord, what fools we mortals be! <laughs> and and we shall find out how foolish we've been on yes. early Monday morning. We certainly will. What do you, as a final question from me, and a final thought? What do you hope when you get to Monday morning? What do you hope this project will have achieved, or what might it be a, a jumping off point for for an, another project or is that all the unknown right now i think it's it is unknown though there are all sorts of ways and opportunities of of sh of sharing in this new world this new community that that we that we have and and sharing both kind of expertise but but also a, a kind of a different kind of audience response in a way uh, and a different kind of audience engagement. I mean, maybe if we were to do this again, we would in, we would we would live stream every rehearsal and 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 let people ask questions as we go through the rehearsal. Whether we would do that, um, you know, as a project or as a full production, um, I guess we'll we'll know we'll know a bit more anyway on on Monday morning as to whether this is a you know a a valid live. Uh, exercise or, or, or just a bit of midsummer madness. <laughs> Excellent. Greg, thank you very much for joining us. Great. Coming out of your busy rehearsal room, they're still going That's on okay. in there. So um, thank you for all your questions. And I think we answered Georgina's and Naomi's before we we even got going. So thank you for your questions. And um, tomorrow we're we're talking with some people about radical dreaming and uh, some examples of what other experiments are going around the world with this play right now. So please join us for that and also keep watching for the actor hangouts because they're pesky those actors, they keep jumping into the bower now and taking over. So um, keep sending us your questions, uh, keep um, enjoying Midsummer Night's Dream and sending us your uh, experiments with the text yourself. Okay, we'll see you soon and enjoy this weekend's performance. Goodbye. Right.